So when I use the, re the phrase, the reckless love of God, when we say it, we're not saying that God himself is reckless. He's not crazy. We are, however, saying that the way he loves is in many regards quite so. But what I mean is this. He's utterly unconcerned with the consequences of his actions with regard to his own safety, comfort, and well-being. His love isn't crafty or slick. It's not cunning or shrewd. In fact, all things considered, it's quite shot-like. And might I even suggest sometimes downright ridiculous. His love bankrupted heaven for you, for me. His love doesn't consider himself first. It isn't selfish or self-serving. He doesn't wonder what he'll gain or lose by putting himself on the line. He simply puts himself out there on the off chance that you and I might look back at him and give him that love in return. His love leaves the 99 to find the one every time. And to many practical adults, that's a foolish concept. But what if he loses the 99 and finding the one, right? What if? Finding that one lost sheep is and will always be supremely important. His love isn't cautious. It's a love that sent his own son to die a gruesome death on a cross. There's no plan B with the love of God. He gives his heart so completely, so preposterously, that if refused, we would think it irreparably broken. Yet he gives himself away again and again and again and again, time and time again. Make no mistake, our sins do pain his heart, and 70 times 7 is a lot of times to get your heart broken. And yet he opens up and allows us back in every single time. His love saw you when you hated him, and all logic said they'll reject me. He said, no, I don't care what it costs me. I lay my life on the line as long as I get their hearts. To make it personal, his love saw me, broken down kid, with regret as deep as the ocean. My innocence and youth poured out like water. And he found me and he put me on his shoulders. And he carried me on. Because he's just that good, he's just that kind. He's a father that never gives up. So as we sing this bridge and chorus one more time, just let it, let it break down those walls tonight. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Yeah. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Yeah, again. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. He's breaking off self-hatred tonight. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow now. There's no shadow you won't light up, bouncing you won't. Come on, let it rise. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come on. Declare it. No shadow now. There's no shadow you won't.
Solomon, listen, when Solomon dedicated the temple, right? He brought in the musicians and the priests to worship, right? And there's this scene where they were like, sacrificed like 900 bulls. Like they're all just dedicating the temple, the house of the Lord. And they bring in the musicians who are worshiping. And it says that the, that the Shekinah glory cloud of the Lord fell so heavy that they couldn't even stand. Like they could visibly see like a cloud in the temple. And it weighed so much that they couldn't even they couldn't even stand up as they were worshiping the Lord. So it's so all you know, around the time they started doing that. Yeah, yeah, they've been worshiping. Yeah, they're oh, worshiping. Jesus was here. Well, I guess it was started. So. Uh, all of creation has worshipped God. Yeah, yeah. There from, was, there was, from the time of creation. Yeah, and there's worship comes music. straight from your heart. Man. There's been so, music and yeah. worship. Remember Lucifer was created for worship. Yeah. yeah, Lucifer, it says in, uh, I think it's, it's in Ecclesi, uh, Ezekiel. It's in Ezekiel mm -hmm. and there's another section, I think, Isaiah. in Isaiah, it's a describing Lucifer, and it, it says his skin was made of, of jewels, and the, in his lungs were made of pipes and timbrels. So whenever he spoke, he was singing. There's a part in the Old Testament Describes the musical instruments to use in detail. Yeah, oh yeah. In the Old Testament. Oh yeah. The cool thing about worship, God says He inhabits the praises of His people. So when we begin to praise, right, God is light and light is released. And whatever that situation is, it could be, let's just say, depression. Right? In Isaiah it says, for the spirit of heaviness, it says, put on the garment of praise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we begin to worship God in that moment of darkness, light invades the darkness. And the Bible says that darkness can't comfort in the light. So anytime you're feeling depressed, anxious, worried, upset, anything like that, or even when you feel good, just give God praise and He inhabits that praise. In the Hebrew, it literally says that He comes in your situation on His throne and judges an ambush. So whatever the enemy's bringing against you, man, your praise is your praise is yep. the breakthrough. Go ahead. I was in an apartment one time. It was one of the lowest points points of my life, and I, I was thinking of suicide and how I could do this the quickest, most efficient way. And at just uh, just one moment, in the middle of that chaos in my head, I felt the Lord tell me, "Just praise." Me. Mm. Yeah. And so I stopped what I was doing. I stood up out of my bed. Who I've been laying in my bed for two days. Stood up and raised my hand and I said, Okay, I'm gonna praise you. And I started just thinking of the songs that I could remember, the old school stuff. And I just it came straight from the heart. I want you to know I found myself on the floor. And I didn't put myself there, but when I came back up he had totally calmed everything and Amen. took away all them thoughts in my head. Amen. And he said, I'm going to restore you. And I held on to that. Amen. Now we've been there, bro. I've been right there. I can tell you, just right, this, just this morning, I woke up kind of uh, stressing about some you know, things or whatever. But uh, just, boom, after worship, like, mm -hmm. you know, got that. I think it's something about when you're putting him... Like when he's your focus, really everything else is so small, man. You know what I mean? Like, you focus on what you see. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm sitting here searching about money, but Justin, me and Justin, and Justin comes in and he's like, "Man, I don't feel too good, but how did Jesus feel going up to that cross?" Mm. I'm like, "Man, you're right. <laughs> Who cares? <Yeah. laughs> Who cares about?" I, I tell money. you how to quit stressing about money. Quit spending so much. <laughs> hey, don't tell me that. You better call my wife. <laughs> so every day I come in. Some of y'all wonder why I come in with a smile on my face. You'll never see me sleepwalking coming in. It's because I get up and I praise the Lord Amen. before I come yeah. here. Yeah. And yeah. on the way here. And after I get here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. 
Right. So good. Right. Yeah. I uh, I I'm speaking again this week, and uh, I've been really stressing because I've been praying for the Lord to put the topic of conversation on my uh, heart, and it's kind of been stressing me out. And uh, just listening to Him praise and worship, it was it was like a revelation. It was taken, and uh, like He said, uh, I I'm not the easy, the best person in the morning. I uh. I've had a lot of trouble, but now that I've been added the responsibility of going to get a brother in the morning, I've been getting up super early. I'm getting su- up super early in this morning. I, just, I prayed about the uh, revelation, and it came to me. And uh, like yesterday, I was in a bad mood on the way back, and uh, John asked me what was wrong, and I told him. And uh, I've been praying for, uh, like, praying for it to be over, and. With one phone call, uh, we'll find out today if it gets uh, if it gets taken care of. But either way, I just feel better about it now, just knowing that you know everything <coughs> happened for a reason, and it was just like wow. <coughs> I'm gonna put them in my morning texting list. Oh boy, three <laughs> thirty. <laughs> hey, you got to you got to check out Lee. You got to check out Second um, Chronicles. I think it's chapter twenty. They were about to go into a war, and the king prayed about the situation. And the word he got from the Lord was, "Put the praisers out in front of the yep. army." Come on. And they put the praisers out. It doesn't make sense in the natural. And uh, man, it said the army or the enemies begin to turn on themselves and begin to take themselves out. And like then there was eighty-six thousand. Yeah, yeah, and then there was spoil left. All the spoil that they had was left, and the army of God went in and collected the spoil. So that's a picture of what happens so like James, today. Yeah, yeah. It says it. The praise caused confusion. Yeah. yeah, like it caused confusion, confusion among the enemy, and they turned on themselves and. I think one of the things the enemy if you notice like in the word the things that bring the most results the enemy comes against the most praying in the spirit worship you know all these different things you see because he knows if we can get a hold of that revelation and begin to implement it in our lives he knows the impact and the influence that it will have not only on our lives but in the lives of others so he comes against those things the most you know so yeah and we've all felt that way like man I, I really I'm feeling the Holy Spirit right now but I don't know about this dancing around or jumping or, or mm-hmm. shouting or anything like that I just I don't want nobody looking at me yeah yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. yeah. Man, busyness break like that me, it's off. busyness like I'll be setting aside some time and I'll be I'll be so excited or I'll even like make it up in my mind like I got a whole nother hour before I have to be somewhere so I'm gonna do this I'm gonna like read or worship or something, and then, man, just busyness creeps in. You're like, what about you? Got to do this or check that or call this. Mm. Yeah, it get me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So I'm gonna say a prayer and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for this this awesome time in your presence. We thank you for just uh, ministering to our hearts this morning through through song. And just speaking to our hearts and through your word, just um, reminding us that heaven went bankrupt for each and every one of us. And we're so thankful that you you gave, you didn't just give anything for us, you gave your very best. And we're so grateful for that. And Father, my prayer for myself and everyone else, people here and people watching, is that the same way that you gave your very best, that we would give our very best. You said to present our bodies a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. And I just pray that we would do that just, just because, just because you loved us first. And Father, we, we're just grateful just for the opportunity. Many countries and many places are not able to do what we're doing right here um, in this awesome country. And we, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the freedom that we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we're just grateful. We thank you for a, a word today, straight from heaven. We receive it by faith, and we say thank you in advance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, 
love is the key. You know, love is the key. Love is what it's all about. And we talk, we've talked several times about this week. We've talked about in, in weeks prior to this, we've talked about this glory. This end time glory that God is pouring out on the church, in the church and on the church. And uh, I just want to look at a, a prophecy that was made real quick just to cast some vision. And we're going to go over to, uh, let's go over to Haggai. Let's go over to Haggai real quick. This is right before Zechariah. What chapter? One or two? Uh, two. Haggai chapter two, verse six. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more... It is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. So... This shaking, he's talking about. He's talking about revival. He's talking about people coming into the kingdom, right? And he talks about coming to the desire of all nations. He's speaking about. We know he's speaking about Jesus Christ, but he's also talking about something that he's going to place on the church. And we've been looking at this glory, and even talking about the glory that Josh was just referring to. Man, this says. That was, the, that was the former temple. <laughs> He's saying the glory in the latter temple was going to be what? Greater. Greater. So that glory that came in, the people were just suspended. Man, he says the glory in the latter temple is going to be even greater than that. And we've been looking at that, right? <coughs> Paul refers to the church as what? The, body. the temple. The body of Christ. The body of the anointing. The temple of what? The Holy Ghost. The latter temple. Not just individually, but guess what? Yeah. Collectively. Yeah, yeah. So he prophesied in that day, in the day prior to his return, he says, the entire earth is going to be filled with what? My glory. My glory. That's why Jesus told the disciples, he said, it's going to be to your advantage that I leave. Why? Because as long as he was there, the glory of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit was in that one spot. But now, the body of Christ covering the entire globe, right? The glory is filling the entire earth. This is he prophesied as the waters fill the seas. Right? You ever heard somebody say something like, man, I don't know what it is. There's just something about you that just makes me want to get saved or you really provoke me. Man, that's that you become a desire. Not because of anything we did, but because of Jesus Christ. Because of what we carry. Right? We've been created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And when they see us, they see Jesus. <laughs> and it causes them to want to get saved. You know? The anointing, the glory that's on our life. And it's nothing that we did other than believe. It's not that we're just so awesome and so cool. It's because we're Christians. Even though we are. We are awesome and cool, yeah. I do walk on the awesome and cool line. Okay. All right, so we've been talking about, you know, the kingdom of God, kingdom life. So the kingdom of God is not like an external kingdom that we're that we're looking at. It's it's what it's within us. That's what Jesus said. He says the kingdom of God is without observation, it's within us. In Romans, he says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Where? In the Holy Spirit. In Matthew, Jesus says to seek the kingdom first, and then what? In all its righteousness. In all things. Amen. Amen. Seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And that's what we've been doing. Right? We've been studying righteousness. 
And he says, seek these things first, and I'll begin to what? Add. You said you were stressing about some needs? Hey, put that word in your mouth. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Start, start giving him praise. In, the, in that moment, start giving him praise and remind yourself, man, God told me if I seek the kingdom first and his righteousness, he says, I'm going to add all things to you. And stand on that. That's not just, you know, some words on paper. That's, that's, a, that's a promise. Right? And God says, so shall my word that goes forth. It shall not return void, but it'll what? Accomplish everything that it sets out to do. And all the promises of God are what? Yes, yes and amen. amen. I got a question. Uh, yes, sir. So right there in that in that text, he's talking about it refers to clothing, shelter, employment. But does it, is he also maybe could it be the things we can't see as well? Yes, that's definitely that. Okay. Yeah. He says all. Yeah. All, all things. things. And my God shall supply what all my needs. An overabundance right. of love, yeah. joy, peace, yeah, yeah. forgiveness. And not according to what we could imagine. Right. But exceedingly yeah. abundantly. And then in, he not only, watch this, he not only meets all our needs, in Psalms 23 he says what? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hello. <laughs> I'm not talking about all I want, but he will. You know, just the overflow, just surplus. And you know, it's not about building us up. It's about building up God's kingdom. Yeah. We got to be faithful over God's kingdom. And that's where the blessing is. You know, we can, you can get out of balance with that real quick and get over in the ditch. You know, but it's all about building God's kingdom. That's what he says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not Chris's kingdom or Josh's kingdom or Jeff's kingdom or Joe's kingdom. Or, no, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then, what? He'll add these things. Things needed to build the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And then as we're faithful, the Bible says as we're faithful over the little things, he'll make us what? Faithful over more. Yeah. Our, more. So we've got to be faithful right where we're at. It's called stewardship. If we want to move into the bigger, if we want to move into the exceedingly and the abundantly, we have to be faithful in the season that we're in right now. And it's not even really about wanting to. It's about being content with such things as you have. Yes. yes. <laughs> being faithful in those Amen. things. Amen. And then... That's where promotion Heart posture. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. very simple. If you don't have it, you're not ready for it. So just chill. Right? Yeah. You know? yeah. Chill. Don't, the, the Bible says this. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Right. Yeah. You got to start somewhere. Yeah. A lot of times, like we said this before, we see the oak tree and we want it. We want it now. But we, we need to go into that acorn season. You know, a lot of people, they step over the acorn trying to get to the oak tree. And God said, no, I need you to go through the process. Mm -hmm. I need you to blossom where you're planting, right? You can't have a harvest if you ain't cultivated your field. Amen. Yeah, Amen. So, a lot, of, a lot of the things that we've been talking about and a lot of the things that we've been sharing is, I believe, just from what I've heard and what I've seen, is a little different than what tradition might teach you, you know. Um, let's, let's look at our, the little handout that I gave you guys yesterday. It's got 12, 11, 19 at the top. I want to finish going down through this. So, when we were in 1 John, uh, let's go to 1 John chapter 2. <coughs> First John chapter two. So first John chapter two, verse one. John says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you what? May not sin. May not sin. Right? That kills that, that kills that crutch of Romans 7 that a lot of people like to hang on to where they take Romans 7 out of context and say, oh, I'm just going to always miss it. I never, oh, you can't live a life without sin. What do you mean? Only Jesus could do that. <laughs> and I'm not saying never making a mistake, you know, but I'm saying as we grow in Christ, those mistakes are going to get less and less. 
yeah. as we grow and as we mature, right? We can't stay at an infant stage in Christ forever. We have to grow up, right? We don't have to, but we need to. If we really want to step, like we were just saying, if we really want to step into the more, right, the more of God, then we have to be faithful in where we're at now, and then we'll be promoted. So he says, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And prior to that, we looked at how he was talking about confessing our sins and what? Entering into the kingdom and being cleansed of all unrighteousness. So if we've been cleansed of all unrighteousness, what does that lead? Righteousness. righteousness. <laughs> and the fruit of righteousness is what? Holiness. Holiness. Yeah. We learned that in Romans chapter 8. Romans, or no, Romans 6, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 6. We learned that in Romans 6. The fruit of righteousness is holiness. So let's come on down. He says, and if anyone sins. See that? It doesn't say, and when we sin. It says, and if anyone sins. Then we have an advocate. So it's not a license to just say, all right, I can just do what I want to do and just live how I want to live. He's saying, no. Go ahead, brother. In King James, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the first part of it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. Not yet. So that's a little, grabs it more home to me that we may not sin. Yeah. That may is a permissive word. Sin yeah. not. Yeah. Right. Amen. In the parable of the lost sheep, in one version it says that he leaves the 99 for they do not need to repent. They're not needing to repent. That means they have not sinned. Oh, yeah. All right, so if we do, and if we do, if anyone sins, we have an advocate, so we know that. We can come before Jesus Christ, and that, that was the thing that we learned um, Romans 6, 7, and 8, that, you know, they were, they were trapped. Uh, the sin nature was their slave master. They, they had no way of escape. They had no way out. They were, they, they were just in this lifestyle of sin, and there was nothing they could do about it, right? And Paul came to that realization, and then through the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, now we're able to, what, receive that sacrifice by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. And now when we, if we sin, we have an advocate. We can go before Jesus. And it says, He Himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. <coughs> right? And that's the, that's the good news, you know, that, you know, God's not mad at you. He sent His Son to die for you. And now, everyone in this world has that opportunity to come in to come into the kingdom. So watch this. Verse 3. In my Bible it says the, the title of this next section is The Test of Knowing Him. And it says, Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. So now he's, talk, he's going down and he's talking about he's elaborating on what, what he just said that I write to you I write these things to you that you what? that you sin not. And now he's saying, this is how you know, this is how you know if a person knows Jesus. It doesn't say, this is how you know if a man or woman is going to heaven. Right? right? Mm -hmm. He says, this is how we know that you know Him. Come on. In other words, this is how we know if you're spending time with Him and you're in relationship with Him. What happens when we spend time with the Father? When we abide in the vine? We get to know Him. We get to know Him. And what happens, what's the result of knowing Him? The intimacy. We're being made like Him. The fruit. We're made like Him. And, and God is what? God is love. So we start doing the things that He did. Amen. I mean, Amen. it just happens naturally. It's not a work. It's just, yeah. it's just you spend time with Him. Right. Yeah. You get to dwell in the secret place of the most high. Amen. So you spend time with that. And his commandments are what? Love him, love your neighbor. Amen. It's that simple. <laughs> love. Love. That's his commandment, love. But I love the, the, the new commandment he left. It's okay, it's easy to say love him, love your neighbor. But he also says, I leave a new commandment, love others like I have loved you. 
Yeah, that's right. raises the bar. Yeah, that's right. He's not talking about a brotherly love or yeah, he's talking about a godly love. Yeah. love. Yeah. Yes. Uh, unconditional, reckless love. Yeah. Sacrificial love. Right. So when we look at so when we look at um, Romans five five, it says the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, and that word love right there, the love of God is agape love, and that's the the new heart we've been talking about in Ezekiel chapter thirty six. That's that new heart of agape love. So until we were born again, like if we could just put a, a, a pin in our timeline of when we were born again and think about every relationship that we may have had before that, we weren't even capable of having the love of God no. before the new birth. What is agape? It's unconditional. God's unconditional love. It's the love of God. It's no, no the, strings attached. Yeah. The New Testament, the New Testament lists the word love like three hundred and something times, but there's five different words. There's like arrows and you know, brotherly love, a, you know, brother, you uh, love you have for your your family. But then there's that agape love, the love of God. So you gotta, I mean, it's it's really kind of generic when you read it in English. You don't really get the full meaning of it until you translate. <laughs> the word from Greek so yeah. okay verse 4 he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him verse 5 but whoever keeps his word truly the love of God is perfected in him by this we know that we are in him so as we as we walk out this truth as we walk out love as we walk our love walk that love has been perfected in us, and I think it's a picture that we saw in 2 Corinthians 3 where it says we go from glory to glory. We're growing. We're progressively going. As we, as we step out in faith, right, every day to walk out this love walk, that love walk will grow in us more and more and more. Amen? Verse 6, watch this. He who abides in him ought to what? Himself also to walk just as he walked. That's total, that's, I mean, I've heard some stuff in some more traditional type churches, and it's total opposite of that. Yeah. I want to point something else out right here, too. you got to be really careful to understand that this scripture right now that we're reading is being spoken to you directly as an individual. You know, if you start thinking, well, this person or that person, you know what I mean? Mm. Because we, we all... We all are at different places yes. in our walk of sanctification. You know what I mean? Right. So for you to take this scripture and go, well, Jeff, he he does this. He must not love God. He, he's not abiding in God. Now, th this scripture is intimately for you, mm -hmm. directly to you. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it should bring us into a place of self-examination. Like, Lord, what can I give you? Because I, I want to abide in you. And I, I want this scripture yeah. to be me. But there is grace for growth. Amen. You know, Amen. Yes. just, just, I can't, I, it wouldn't be fair for me to compare everything that I'm doing in the kingdom and how much I love him and he loves me to someone who was just born again because it, there's grace for that sanctification process. Amen. And it doesn't mean that they don't love him or abide in him. It's really the heart posture. Yes. And sometimes it's just about knowledge. They just haven't, they might be doing something they don't even know yet because <laughs> they haven't got into that portion of the word yet. Yes. You know what I mean? So just remember, uh, this like is to speak uh, on that too. It's like it's very important that you're not holding judgment over somebody else, especially one who is a believer, because at any moment they could have bathed that in the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. And you cannot come against a child of His. Amen. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like there are scriptures about that. Yeah. Coming yeah, against right. a child of his. Yeah. Better you have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown in the depths of the sea than hurt one of my children. Amen. Well, it says, judge not, at least she be judged. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. if, if yeah. you want to walk in the agape grace and love of God, then you, then you got to reciprocate no it to your brothers. Yeah, that's it. Amen. And that's what love is. I yeah. mean, man, uh, God passed over his judgment by the blood of his son. Yeah. That's what that's what his love is. And so for us to abide in him, yeah. we we certainly can't. The scripture is not meant to uh, hit anybody else in the mouth. It's really, even though I do that a lot, I'm sorry. It's really, <laughs> you know, it's really self-examination. Yeah. yeah, 
Smith, this, not, is, this is meant for you right now. Yeah, amen. Individually. Right. And if we, I feel like if you look at, if you look at the life of Jesus, who he is, Jesus is the standard, the word of God. If you look at Jesus' life, and we compare individually, if we compare ourselves to Jesus, there's going to be somewhere that we're missing it. Everybody. Yeah. Different yeah. levels. So we should always look to Jesus. And that's what Hebrews 12 says. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher. Finish Don't look at this brother or that brother. And that's comparison kills. Right? And it's not about condemnation. It's about self-examination, about looking at Jesus. And it says, as we behold him, we're transformed into that image. You know, well, you're just setting your bar at the person next to you. When your your bar should be the relationship. Amen. 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 Yeah, now, does that one more thing too? That doesn't mean that if my brother, you know, Galatians six says, restore your brother gently. Yeah. Right. You know, it doesn't mean if I see my brother off that I can't come up to him and say, hey, brother, let me help you. Let me let me help you. Let me encourage you to do the right thing. Let me help you restore. But to judge, you miss the mark. Yeah. Amen. Recognizing sin and a, a, a fault in a brother and condemning them are two different things. That's right. Coming alongside him saying, hey, you may not know this is, is wrong and, and giving holy correction, you know, and, and building them up in that way, but just to go up to him and say, you're going to hell for this. You need to change your ways. Brimstone and fire. Ah, that's, that is, judgment that's right. is not in our you can uh, you can see when it comes out of love it goes straight right. to that brother it'll be confident in confidence mm -hmm. and then nice. nobody else has to know and it'll be kind yeah because yeah. the kindness of God judgment once you reach judgment it's it doesn't work man judgment guess what <coughs> we see the law judgment didn't work yeah judgment brought what death death right amen so what worked the love the kindness wow so if we just you know not saying we can't approach a, a brother and restore him in love, but we just, you know, the, the heart has to be in the right the right place. Never in comparison. Yeah. Okay. Let's come on down. Verse 7. Brethren, I write to you no new commandment. Excuse me. I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Verse 11, But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So, one of the things that I that caught my attention right here was verse 10 and it says that if we walk in light and we walk this love walk out that he's talking about here he says there will be no cause for stumbling in us so if you want to if you want to walk a walk and, and not stumble it's the love walk you know and here's the thing when we do if we do get out of love you know, we have the advocate. You know, we can go back before Jesus and say, hey, I missed it, and then we're right back. We're right back in line again. But that's where we want to be. We want to, we want to get into a place where we can walk without stumbling. And then verse 11, it says, you know, if you have something against your brother, it says you're in darkness, and you're in so much darkness that your eyes are literally blinded, and you don't even know where you're going. <laughs> So that's like the vision that God has for your life has been what? Darkened. It's not that He wants to block the vision, but when you get outside of love, darkness is released and you can't even... But in that sense, it's not Him blocking our vision, but we're blocking our own. We're doing it to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. You know? his, will, his will is His perfect will. Like he, he wants light. I mean, he wants... He desires fellowship. He yeah. desires that we walk in love. He desires that we walk in the light. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says, whatever a man sows, what? That shall he reap. For if he sows into the flesh, he'll reap corruption. But if he sows into the spirit, he'll reap what? Everlasting life. So some key indicators, some practical indicators. Of this. Like, let's say 
you, you start to want to separate yourself. You don't want to be around those people. You don't want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, you might need to do a gut check. You know, you don't want to fellowship. You don't, you don't really feel like going to church anymore. You know, those people are this or those people are that. You know, if you start to get into that place, you, you might want to do a, a gut check, a fruit yeah. check. Couple more minutes. Oh. Wow. So one of the things, uh, one of the thing that I want to look at is over in Ephesians two. Ephesians two, starting around. This is on your on your handout. Let's just start with verse one and just come down. Ephesians chapter two, verse one. And he, and you, he made alive, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. So you could say, tying into what we've been talking about, we were dead, we had the sin nature, we were lost, and now through the word of God, through Jesus, he's made us what? He's made us alive. <clears throat> At one time, we were dead in trespasses and sins, in which... We used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So we, we were all in that place. We were all lost. We were all in darkness. We were all you know, being led by the wrong spirit. But in verse 4 it says, but God, amen, but God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Amen? So we, we've made this statement a lot that we weren't, we, don't, we, we didn't work to get saved, but because we are saved, we, we, what? we do good work. So this is a good passage that will tie into that saying. So we weren't saved by works, but it says we were saved by what? When we were dead in our trespasses, we were made alive with Christ by what? Grace. We were brought into the kingdom. Now that we've been brought in the kingdom, it says we have been raised up together and made to sit together in heavenly places with who? With Jesus Christ. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And the Bible says we're seated far above every power, principality. Right? Every, every level of darkness. And then it says every name that's named, we have been seated above that. Right? In heavenly places. That's, that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. It's kind of like what comes to mind is yesterday we were talking about how Moses had this glory and he could go up to the mount, but he had to what? He had to come back down and the glory would fade. But we have this position. We've been given this position. Jesus said in the Gospels, he says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, he says, you may be. He said, present tense. Where I am, you may be. What was he talking about? A position. Moses had to come back down from the mount, and this says we have been made to what? Sit. Sit. We can just dwell. We can abide. He who dwells, you brought this up earlier, Justin, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall what? Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And we're seated in that place. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. So what? For what reason? That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Why? Because it's His goodness and kindness that leads people to repentance. We just talked about that. Right? Yes. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Watch this. Verse 10. We weren't saved by works, but watch this. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. 
See that? We were saved by grace, not works. But we were created and saved for what? That we might do good works. Which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To make it practical, the same thing we talked about in 1 John 2. If we abide in Him, we'll what? We'll walk just as He walked. We'll walk just as He walked. And how did He walk? He walked in good works. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, and He went about doing what? Good. Healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So this whole thing, I'm just a man... You know, I'm just going to make mistakes. That's, that's just, no, that's the devil's lie. That is a lie from hell. Like I remember um, somebody tried to make this statement one time. Oh, every man lusts over women. That's not true. That's not true. Every man masturbates. Every man looks at theme books. That's not true. That's not true for me. I don't, I'm, not, I'm speaking for myself. When I got, when I came into the kingdom, I threw that stuff on the altar and I never looked back. I never went back. I can honestly say that before you. I'm not saying those thoughts hadn't tried to come, but you got to guard your heart. You got to guard your mind. Got to conform to the image. Man, there's a there's a way that God's calling us is, is holiness. He says God told the church. He said, "What? Come out of the world. Come out." Set your things on. Think, set your mind on things above. Uh, your eye is singular. Yeah. If your eye is singular, you'll be what? Full of light. Flooded with light. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. And he's saying, "I have created you. I have recreated you, not to live in your own way of life, but he says, I have created you for what? Good works. That you should walk in them." Why? When, when people see you, when people see the transformation, when they see your new life, man, they love that. They desire that. It makes them want to get saved and come in the kingdom. Amen. So, when we wear that armor, we can, we can ward off any attack from the devil. Amen. And we need That's to know right. even when I put my armor down, I still have a God that will ward off those attacks. You never put the armor down. Yeah. Um, something the Holy Spirit is speaking to me right now just I want to share it is that we don't need anything but Him Amen. I think peer pressure sometimes uh, what people think of us seeking affirmation of others it, it really could get us you know as far as like you said pornography what the world thinks what the world finds acceptable but it, I think we the Lord really wants us to get you don't need anything but me you know, in, in every relationship that we have, whether it be marriage, friendships, brothers, whatever in Christ, every relationship has to come from the place that I don't need anything but Him. Amen. You know what I mean? We got to yeah. get that. Yeah, I think, like we talked about, um, we talked about Hebrews where it says, um, uh, talking about the talking about a reward that those who come to God without faith it's impossible to please God. And those who come to Him must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder to those who diligently seek Him. So the reward is Him. Yeah. The reward His is Him. Yes. The reward is Him. His presence. That's it. That's right. And that's all we need. And everything flows out of that. That's all we need. Yeah. yeah. And, and every and every relationship that we have has to come from that place of His presence because we'll we'll just get so caught up into confirmation, like needing confirmation, and then it's just really setting ourselves up uh, for failure. I mean, for hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm.